47, I think. Um, but it flew nonstop. The big advantage of the twin Mustang was it had two pilots, so it could fly on longer missions because the pilots could trade off flying. Also, in a combat situation, one pilot could concentrate on flying and the other could concentrate on the weapons and defending the plane. It had a range of 10,000 miles. It was built at the end of World War II and um, built to fly from North America to um, Japan and back. Leading edge, and this is more aerodynamic. Later models, as this one is, included four jet engines, so this had a total of ten engines. Six propeller engines and four jet engines. Six turning and, two, and four burning, was what the crew would say. Two console, two cockpits, uh, one for the trainer and one for the student pilot. Uh, it is based on the F-80, which was an early jet fighter used in the Korean conflict. <clears throat> It was also called T-Birds. This particular plane is the only non or the only civilian aircraft allowed to fly over New York on September 12th after the attack the day before. So they took pictures uh, of the damage and it's the only civilian aircraft able to do that. Both fighters both developed during the Korean conflict. But these are later models. This is an F-86, the Sabre. Um, the F-86 was developed to fight the MiG-15 during the Korean conflict. Um, and this is a later model. Now, this model has radar. The earlier models did not. That's what the black nose is. And this has no guns. The original uh, F-86 has uh, six guns in the nose. But this uses missiles, these missiles, this tray drops down and fires missiles. So there are no guns on, on this plane at all. And this is missiles in the nose and then also on this uh, wing mounted pod. So the same basic airframes, but no guns. Use of missiles instead. The F-94 also had what's called an afterburner, one of the first planes that have an afterburner. An afterburner spent fuel is dumped into the hot exhaust and burned again for bursts of speed. It never went into production, so they only had the prototypes to use. Now, this is, now the way the nomenclature works in the Air Force, fighter, C is for cargo, T is for trainer, but this is a WB-50. What they did, this was not used as a bomber. It was used as a weather plane to gather weather information, but they used the B-50 airframe. So if they use an airframe, that's the B-50, but for another purpose, the WB-50, it will have two letters. So that's what was done with this plane. So no guns. Even though it didn't have any guns, they, did, they painted these gun ports on it, but those are just painted on did not have any guns. The camera is below the pilot, and these two bulges are the film canister for the reconnaissance camera. Um, this is the lens right there. So again, it was an F-86 airframe, but they use it for reconnaissance, so this is an <coughs> RF-86. B-36 had a range of 10,000 miles, and the reason it had such incredible range is they hadn't developed mid-air refueling. They finally did, and this is one of the first planes to do it. On the tail is a boom, and an operator will fly that. It has little winglets on the end of it. It actually flies in the slipstream behind the plane, and then the, the receiving plane comes in. a story about a crew chief that had replaced fuses in the wing, and then after they got out in the air, he realized he put the wrong ones in. So he was crawling through the wings, changing out the fuses, so he had the right fuses in. This carried 33,000 gallons of fuel. That's a fuel tank there, and then there are four in each wing. Had a crew of between 13 and 15 people. And as I said, the biggest bomber ever made. A B-36 never dropped a bomb in anger. 
as I said, it was in service during Korea, but it was not used in that theater. It was used strictly by SAC as a nuclear deterrent. Now, this plane out, out here, it has these large triangular shaped wings. The reason they call it Delta is in the Greek alphabet, the symbol for Delta is a triangle. So it has these uh, swept back, which give you much more speed. And then you have to have different control surfaces because it doesn't have um, the ailerons or the <coughs> elevators on the tail as most points do. the ejection seat. It included this system where the pilot would actually seal himself in a capsule and that would be ejected and that would offer more protection at those high speeds. So that's the actual uh, ejection capsule that was used with this plane. Uh, during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis of the 1960s, at the time, the Air Force had what was called DEFCON, which is Defensive Condition. If you're at DEFCON 5, um, it's pretty normal, everything's okay. If you're at DEFCON 1, you're in nuclear war. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, we went to DEFCON 2. Very close. The Russians had built uh, nuclear missiles on Cuba, which is 90 miles off our, the shore of Florida, uh, could easily um, attack uh, cities in the United States. That was defused. They backed down and pulled out all those missiles. As part of that agreement, we had missiles like this in Turkey, Turkey and Italy. As part of that agreement, we pulled out those missiles um, as a reciprocal part of that agreement. Could be launched from the United States. Um, the Titan I had a problem though. It had to be raised from the silo and it had to be fueled, which took 15 minutes. Well, when you're talking about a nuclear exchange, 15 minutes is a lot of time. So the Titan II could be launched in a minute. Big improvement. But it was basically the same missile that they um, enhanced, that we use today. The Minuteman, named after in the American Revolution, the soldier, civilian soldiers were called Minuteman because they were ready in a minute's notice. So this is an early Minuteman. The main advantage with the Minuteman is it has solid rocket fuel, not liquid. That meant that it could be stored in the silo for long periods of time. With the liquid fuel, you had to occasionally drain all the fuel out and refuel them. But with solid rocket fuel, you didn't have to do that. So this is an early Minuteman. And now this is called a Peacekeeper. We do not use this, rock, this missile anymore. This had uh, multiple warheads. So the one missile. The reason we don't use that is we signed a treaty with Russia that said we would not use the missiles with multiple warheads. So that's why we don't use the Peacekeeper anymore. And some of the Minuteman had been modified to deploy more than one warhead. We had to take them back so they were all just one, one warhead for missiles. Once they authenticate the order, two independently, two independent people had to insert keys and they had to turn them simultaneously. That's the only way the missile would launch. So you'll notice that there are two chairs, but they're separated so that you couldn't do something like this. Um, based on the airframe of the MiG-15, but it has two engines instead of one, and this was capable of supersonic speed. It wasn't a bomber that was repurposed. It was specifically designed to be a side wing. It had an altitude uh, initially of about 50,000 feet. Uh, up to 70,000 and basically the thought was if you can fly fast enough or high enough you can't be shot down and for a while that was true but then uh, Gary Powers, Gary Francis Powers was shot down uh, he survived the crash uh, the Soviet Union put him on trial public trial uh, they displayed the wreckage he received I think he received the sentence of 10 years hard labor. Uh, he was later uh, traded for a Russian spy, came back to the United States, and that was the rest of his life as the United States.
in contact with the pilot of the U-2. And the two of them, the pilot on the ground in the car, talks him down because as he lands and finally he's on the runway, he's got to stay on those two wheels because he can't, if he goes too much, the wing tip's going to dig into the, the paint, into the runway. So very difficult, very difficult plane to fly. Um, we still use you two. We call them something different now. We call them TR things. But um, it's the same basic plane. These U2s had to resign their commissions uh, from the Air Force. They couldn't be Air Force uh, anymore. Uh, so that was a big decision for them. But that was the first purposefully developed spy Blackbird. This flies at Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, at 80,000 feet ceiling. In its entire career, a Blackbird was never shot down. It goes too fast and flies too high to be shot down. Radical uh, airframe. This is also the beginning of stealth, or what we would later call stealth. It is coated with a radar absorbing material and you'll notice the tails are not straight up, they're candid. That's because of um, radar reflection back. Um, this is an incredible plane. As I said, uh, Mach 3, it is the fastest air breathing plane today, still. Uh, it's not in service now, but, and as you can see, it had interchangeable noses depending on what kind of reconnaissance they wanted to obtain. You know, those heights, you develop an incredible amount of heat. And titanium is very good for dissipating heat. But guess where the best source of titanium was? Russia. So the CIA set up all these dummy companies, and they bought titanium in small batches. So basically, the Russians gave us the titanium so we could build a plane to spy on them. <laughs> that we used. And it's just distinguishing character of this plane, fuselage is, three, is longer than the wingspan. Usually it's the other way around. The wings are longer than the, than the fuselage. But this has these very short, stubby wings, and so the fuselage is actually longer than its wingspan. Now these wings are so thin that when it was on the ground, they actually put shields on the leading edge because working around it, you could cut yourself on, on the wing. But the F-104 was just an incredible plane. Um, the plane that's on a post that looks like it's taking off when you approach, that's also an F-104, like this plane. And this is the F-106, which looks a lot like the F-102. It basically is uh, the F-102 better, uh, refined, more, <coughs> more capabilities. It was on a training flight and it went into a flat spin, and the pilot couldn't get it out of the spin, so he ejected. After he ejected, the plane righted itself and did a belly landing by itself in a field. <laughs> Some minor damage to the, under, to the bottom undercarriage, it was fixed and was flying again. They think what happened was when he ejected, it was his weight, the ejection seat, the canopy also comes off, that that change in weight centered the plane so that it could just land itself. So I'm sure the pilot got some ribbon for not needing him to, to land. The main anti-radar or anti-aircraft artillery was, was an SA-2, which was radar guided. Well, the only way to find where these launch points were is to fly around and get them to turn their radars on. And the only reason they'll turn the radars on is to shoot you down. So the wild weasels would go in before a strike package, fly around and get them, the enemy to turn on their radars and try to shoot them down. If they did, they had special ordnance that would home in on that radar beam and go right down and destroy the launcher. But as you can see, very, very dangerous. They would go in before the strike package, once the strike package left. Wall heading Berlin into east and west. Um, and these are all sections from the Berlin Wall. This is a piece of the Berlin Wall. And after it came back, we got these sections. So these are all sections um, of the Berlin Wall.
the one side, um, graffiti artists or artists painting all kinds of things on the one side. This is a Russian car that probably would have been on a waiting list for months, maybe a year, to get it. Um, but this is about all you can get. Really had very crude, almost no guidance system. They were more of a terror weapon. You didn't know where they were, when they came down, exactly where they would come down. Um, and so the coalition was very keen on finding these scud launchers um, and eliminating them because of the terror value and escalating the conflict. So this plane is a scud hunter, and he tried to find um, those scuds so that they could be destroyed and then launched. They used camels because it was desert storm. So, uh, yeah, that's that's just like a, a fighter pilot keeps track of how many kills or a bomber keeps track of how many raises. That's the efficiency. Like a diamond, and that is because a conventional airplane, when radar hits it, it hits that plane, it returns a signature, and that's how they can tell what kind of plane it is, where it is, how fast it's going. When radar hits this goes off scatters in all directions. It doesn't return. So this is virtually invisible to radar. Um, the F-117, but it really isn't. It's really a bomber. Um, really didn't have any defensive weapons except for stealth. Uh, the bomb bays were internal. They were not open until they were ready to drop the bombs because with those doors open like that, again, uh, you could see it on radar. When they were testing it, they had a model of the airframe on a missile range on a pole. And they went back in, they turned on the radar, and they spotted it. So they were real thrilled about that. Someone grabbed some binoculars, there was a bird sitting on the model. And they went and chased the bird away, turned on the radar again, nothing. It was picking up the bird, it wasn't picking up the plane. Other factors of stealth. This is a very quiet airplane. Um, it is subsonic, it is not supersonic, um, but it's very, very quiet. Another part of stealth is heat, the heat signature. This does not have big exhaust pipes like the F-15. It has slits on the trailing edge of the wing, and that's the exhaust, and the exhaust Right before it leaves the plane, there are things called bricks, which are substances that absorb heat, so it pulls the heat off that exhaust. It comes out, so very low heat signature. You don't know it's been there until something blows up. The man that was on the program that designed this plane uh, told a story. He was watching CNN during Desert Storm. In the early phases of, of Desert Storm, he said, Reporters were saying, we don't understand why, but they're reporting their lost communication um, features and, and facilities. And they don't really know why. Well, he knew why. They were sending in F-117s, blowing these things up, and then they were gone before they ever knew they were there. <clears throat> uh, no F-117 was, was shot down during the Desert Storm conflict, um, but a radical only flew at night, uh, that's why it's painted black, and when they were trained, it only flew at night, so pilots had to sleep in rooms where all the windows blocked up because they were pretty much all night flying. 